Welcome to Faith Point, the podcast ministry of First Southern Baptist Church of Prescott Valley with Senior Pastor Terrell Eldreth. Our goal is to allow our faith to intersect with real life. So let's join Pastor Terrell today as he shares with us from God's Word. Our prayers we come to God's Word. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, for the fact that it's not dependent on, on PowerPoint slides and videos and to be able to be effective and powerful. Father, it has been powerful since you gave it, and it will continue to be for all of eternity. So, Father, we pray that we would give attention to your word this morning. We pray that Jesus would be glorified, that he would speak to our hearts and to our lives. Father, we, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship and to adore you. To be able to tell you how much we love you and to be able to know that you love us and that you express that love through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, Father, we pray for those who are here today who maybe have never trusted Jesus to be their Savior. We pray that today that they would hear about a Savior who loves them and, and that they would give their heart to him and, and receive the forgiveness of sin and eternal life that he offers. Father, for those of us who've already done so, we pray, Father, that you would just encourage us in our walk with you. We pray that Jesus would be glorified in all that we would do, the decisions that we will make this morning uh, in regard to your word, in regard to who Jesus Christ is. We pray that the Holy Spirit would have power to move and work. Pray against Satan, who's just trying to mess things up today. We pray that you just move him out of the way. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would have freedom to, to touch our hearts and lives in a powerful way. Now, Father, we commit the remainder of this time to you, for we pray these things in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. All right, you should be in Romans chapter 9. You have your sermon notes out. Um, we are talking about Romans, a testament of faith and action. And last week we were in chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 5. And today we're going to come back and we're going to look at six through thir- verses 6 through 33. Um, you say, well, that's a lot of verses, and it is. And, and, um, and if... If we were to separate the book of Romans chapter 9, if we were to just take chapter 9 out of the Bible, take it out of the book of Romans, um, then without the context of the, verse, the chapters that come before and the chapters that come after, because this finds itself you know, just at the beginning of the second half of the book of Romans in chapter 9, um, if we were to, it, would, it would lose context and... And I got to tell you, Romans chapter 9, without that context, would be very difficult to understand. This is not an easy book to come to. And and, and, and if we were to take it out of context, it might bring us to some very wrong theological conclusions. And so so we're going to approach this chapter today with with great care. Um, In this book on Romans, uh, commentator William Barclay uh, many of you know who he is or who he was, he's in heaven now, uh, quotes a New Testament scholar who said this about Romans chapter 9. He said, uh, we wish Paul hadn't written it. That's not a good statement for a theologian to make, biblical theologian anyway, and I don't think that's, a, that's really what we ought to say because all scripture is inspired by God. And so we don't, want to, we don't just want to take it out. But it's also true that Romans 9 comes with some challenges all of its own. And so we're going to kind of walk, walk through this a little bit today. In this chapter, Paul seems to be saying that God is arbitrary and unfair. And so if you just took Romans chapter 9, and this is all you knew about the Bible or this New Testament, you'd say, wow, God's pretty arbitrary. And, and God does seem to be unfair if we, that's all we have to look at. And, and we might choose, uh, you know, uh, that you know, God might choose to have mercy on us, um, but the person on next, next to you, he might not want to, or vice versa. And that doesn't leave us with a real comfortable feeling. And so in this chapter, we're going to see that Paul uses Isaac and Ishmael as examples and remember, they were, the, they were the two sons that we know about of, of, of Moses, um, I mean, of, not Mo, of, uh, of Abraham. Um, and, uh, and then we have also then Isaac's twin sons, Jacob and Esau, that he uses as examples. And in using them, especially in Jacob and Esau, he quotes the verse in which God says in verse 13 here of chapter 9, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So you let that just sit for a minute and think, 
well, I don't know where God's going with this, or I don't know what, what God was thinking, um, but, but these are exact, exact quotes from, from the book of Exodus, and, and then he quotes from Exodus again, in, in which, um, uh, that was in Genesis, but in Exodus he says again, uh, it, through Moses, he says in verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it sounds like in these verses that God, that God is arbitrary and exclusive, but these verses are not where the book of Roman ends. This is not the end of the book, and neither is Paul finished making his point when he makes those statements. So I want you to hang with me for a little bit, and let's look at what he says. Because in Romans chapter 10, when we get there uh, very soon, uh, Paul will go on to say in verse 11, anyone who trusts in him, talking about God, will, or Jesus Christ, will never be put to shame. So anyone who, talks in Je- who trusts in Jesus Christ is not going to be put to shame. And he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound arbitrary at all. There's nothing arbitrary about those, that anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ won't be put to shame. Everyone who calls on his name uh, will be saved. And so there isn't anything exclusive about that. And the invitation of God has been extended to all. The door is open to ever will come. And so, the, so we have to understand that Paul is making a point in this passage of Romans chapter 9 about the nature of God, He's going to talk about the mercy of God and the nature of our relationship with him. And he shows us why we can indeed trust God. Why should you and I put our trust in God? Is he trustworthy or is he arbitrary? Or is he, is he somebody who, who is just um, wishy-washy? And that's what we're going to look at this morning There are three truths in Romans chapter 9 that I want us to notice this morning. Three truths about God, his mercy, and our relationship with him. The first thing that I want you to understand is that God can do what he wants to do. Would you agree with that? God can do whatever in the world he wants to do. Um, He can do what he wants to do, and he, he doesn't need anyone's permission to do it. He doesn't have to check with the boss. He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to, to check a standing operating procedure. You know, am, I, am I doing the right thing? God always does the right thing, and he does whatever he wants to do. He has, doesn't need any permission to do that. And so um, he can love who he wants to love. God can forgive who he wants to forgive. And God can condemn who he wants to condemn. That's his prerogative. What you didn't get to see was a, was a video of, of a man making a pot on a potter's wheel. If you look at the front of your ministry guide, that was kind of what you would have been watching anyway. And, you, and probably we all know what a potter's wheel is. And we know that, that the potter does not look at the clay and say, Clay, what do you want to be? He just makes it what he desires for it to be. And, and God doesn't owe you or me anyone or, or to anyone anything. God is sovereign. He could do whatever he wants to do. And you and I are not and never will be in a position that we can dictate to God uh, our own personal concept of right and wrong. God is not waiting for us to dial him up and say, God, you're getting some stuff wrong here. Let me tell you what's right. Let me set you straight. That is not who God is. He dictates to us the difference between right and wrong. And neither are we in a position to judge God, but God is always in a position to judge us. And so we have this God who's very different than we are in those regards. We don't have that kind of sovereignty, but God does. And he's in that position to judge us, and that is because he is God. He made it all, he owns it all, and he makes the rules. That's the universe that we live in. Um, to, To anyone who might say this is unfair, Paul says this in Romans chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. He says, but who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? 
Does not the potter have the right to make out, excuse me, make out of the lump, uh, the same lump of clay, some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Now, Paul is, is simply giving an illustration here, the illustration that I didn't get to show you on the screen. It's an illustration that is, that, is, that is not a perfect parallel to a spiritual truth, but it sheds light on it. And that's okay. Those who wrote scriptures many times used illustrations to, to give us understanding, not that they were perfect illustrations or, or parallels, but they, were, they would help us that, have that light. And in this, this sense, illustrations are good examples but this is not a perfect example. But Paul's example reminds us that God has the right to do with us what he wants because he is what? He is our creator. He has a right to do that. He is our creator. Let me share another example with you, perhaps, another illustration. Some of you might, I could say, do you ever, do some of you play Minecraft, but probably the only people who do that just left the room <laughs> on their computers. But some of you are, I don't want to say old enough or young enough or old enough, somewhere in that, that, that you might have played Sim City on your computer at one time or another. I'm not saying sin city, sim, S-I-M, as in simulation. Some of you are saying, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Don't worry, it's okay. Some of you bought the program, and you put it on your computer, and you played it. And the, the whole premise was that you would build your own civilization. You would build your own city, and you would, and you would decide where the houses would go uh, in, in, this, in your in your imaginary on your computer world you would decide um, how commerce would be conducted you would you would decide what amenities would be made available to the public how the economy was going to be driven and on and on and on uh, and and it's your game and guess what you get to do you get to make the rules don't you you make the rules in that game now, imagine if the quote-unquote people that you created in your SimCity game looked at you through the computer screen and said, Hey, we don't like your rules. We don't want to have to live here. We don't like this economy. We want you to make some changes. Would they have the right to do that? No, first of all, you'd be a little startled, but then you would look at them and you would say, Hey, wait a minute. I paid for and bought this this computer program, I purchased the computer that it's on, I put it on that computer program, and I did all the work, and I'm doing, and I'm making all the rules. Again, it's not a perfect illustration, but it sheds light on when we get upset with God and say, God, I want to make some changes in your rules. I'm not really sure I like where you're headed with this. And so let me, let me suggest some things that would be more fair or some things that would be right that I don't think are right right now. Or you could change some wrongs that I think are wrong. We don't stand in that position to be able to do that. But here's where both Paul's example and my example are imperfect. They're imperfect because you and I and everybody else on the face of the earth are not mere pots of clay. We are not made just as lumps of clay. And we are not a series of binary ones and zeros in computer code. We are human beings made in the image of God. We are made in his image. And God doesn't treat humans with disregard. He just doesn't do that. The Bible, as we've already seen, uh, it, and we will see again, says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God cares about us. God can do anything he wants to do because he is God. So let me ask you, what does God want to do then? If God can do whatever it is that he wants to do, 
What does he want to do? I didn't give you any place to write this in your notes because I just didn't have room to put it in there, but you can write this on the side somewhere if you're, you're wondering, what would God want to do? Let me share a few things that God wants to do. The first thing that we see is God wants to save you. He really wants to save you. That's why he sent Jesus Christ in the world to die in your place. That's what John 3.16 is about. We are lost in sin and he wants to save you. Secondly, he wants to forgive you. In order to save you, you have to be forgiven. Why? Because we're guilty. We're guilty of sin. We're guilty of rebelling against God. We are sinners. And we need God's forgiveness. And so God says, I desire to forgive you. And I show you that by sending my son, Jesus Christ, to be the payment for your sin so that I can forgive you. And he wants to help you. He wants to help you. Anybody here need help? Yes. Do we need help getting through life? Do we need help getting through relationships? Do we need help dealing with, with physical problems and all the other things that come with life? Of course we do. And God says, I want to help you. I want to be with you. I want to be where you are all the time. He wants to bring us things like peace and love and joy into our lives. He wants to give you his peace, his love, and his joy. He wants to fill your life with his presence. He said, I want to be alive in you, and I can do that if you let me be your Savior. And he wants to give you the desires of your heart. Can you imagine that? He wants to give you the desires of your heart. This God, this God who can do anything he wants to do because he is, after all, God, wants more than anything to give you a life here on earth that is full of purpose. He says, I want to fill your life with purpose, and he wants, to spend, he wants you to spend all of eternity with him in heaven. I like that God. That's the God that we have. This is a God who can do whatever he wants to do, but that's what he chooses to do, to pour those things into our lives, the, to save us, to forgive us, to help us, to give us peace, love, and joy, to fill us with his presence, and to fill the desires of our heart and to give us that purpose here on, life, on earth to know what it is he wants us to do so why can we trust that God why can't we trust that God maybe a better question but why can we trust God then we can trust God for three reasons first of all because God is not arbitrary and vindictive he is not arbitrary and vindictive I'll let you think about how to spell those two words for a moment, and then we'll go on. He's not arbitrary and vindictive. The Bible says that he acts after, out of his own goodness. He is always good. He's always just. He's always holy. He's always righteous. That never changes. So it's never arbitrary. And it might surprise you, but you can trust God because he is not out to get you. There are a lot of people who believe that God's out to get them. They believe that God is just waiting for them to do something stupid so he can just stomp on them. Well, we would not be here if that were the case. None of us would have lived that long. How many of you, since we were here last Sunday, did something stupid in which God could have stomped on you? Well, all the deacons raised their hands. That's good. <laughs> He's not out to get you. He loves you. He says, I want to pour my goodness into your life. And thirdly, he is out to give you a great life. He doesn't want to ruin your life. He wants it to be spectacular. Jesus said, I came that you have my life and me have it in full. That's what he wants to do. God can do whatever he wants to do. That's what he wants. He, he is not arbitrary and vindictive. He's not out to get you. He wants you to have a great life. So understand, first of all, God can do whatever he wants to do. 
Secondly, you need to understand a relationship with God is based on His mercy. It's always based on God's mercy. Not anything else, but His mercy. Paul says it very plainly here in Romans 9, 16. He says, It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. There's this theme that Paul has addressed repeatedly in the book of Romans, and he will continue to hammer it home. And that is that we are not saved by our own good works. We are not saved because we've done anything worthy of being saved. We are not saved because we're good people. We do not earn right standing with God. You can't buy it. You can't work for it. Uh, you can't inherit it. Um, it, just, it just doesn't come that way. It always comes by mercy. Why? Because we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And if we get or got what we deserve, the wages for our sins would be death. Paul's already told us in this book. Death, eternal separation from God. But God has given us what we don't deserve. He gives us something that we could not earn. He extends his mercy to us. He forgives us. He wipes, remember, our slate clean. He gives us a fresh start. And that's all done because God is good, not because we are good. Because we are not good. Not according to God and not compared to God. We're not. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he said, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. Uh, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We don't earn our salvation. We don't work for it. God simply gives it to us. And you will never be good enough to earn God's forgiveness. Um, I think kind of somewhere deep down intrinsically, we all understand that. It, I think everyone understands that. And it causes some people to develop a concept of this disapproving God in their mind. They have this concept that, that God is a God uh, who's never satisfied with anything that we do. And, and there are some people who believe that about God. In fact, there are some religions who preach that about God. But I got to tell you that that is nothing close to what the Bible tells us about God. The Bible does not tell us that that's the God that we have. In fact, um, Romans 3.10 says, There is no one righteous, not even one. The Bible tells us you don't have to worry about trying to be good enough to get to God because you won't be. Because you're not good enough to do that. None of us are. It goes so far to say in Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shriveled up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We're all unclean. Our righteousness, our goodness is like filthy rags, and that means a dirty diaper. The Bible teaches us that we're sinful and that we will never measure up to God's perfect standard of holiness. And it also teaches us that for this very reason, God does something. He extends his mercy to us. He looks at you and he says, you can't get to me. I know it. I know who you are. I know the mess of your life. I know the sin. But here is my mercy. Would you just receive the mercy that I want to give to you? Paul says in Romans 3, verse 24, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Mercy, remember, is not receiving what we deserve. We deserve death. Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. What we, what we don't deserve. We don't deserve that free gift of eternal life. 
but God gives it to us. You're never going to deserve what God wants you to have. You're never going to deserve that great life. You're never going to deserve the freedom of forgiveness and his love and his peace and his joy. And the best deeds of the best person here today still amount to nothing more than filthy rags. The best person here today is in the same boat as the worst person here today. We all need God's mercy. Last Sunday morning, we talked about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You remember that? Before we sat together in the communion service. And Wednesday was, was Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement for the Jewish people. And I came across a statement that was, that was, was sad, but enlightening at the same time. Written by a man named Jonathan Sachs. It says, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the Holy of Holies of Jewish time. It is that rarest of phenomena, a Jewish festival without food. Instead, it's a day of fasting and prayer, introspection and self-judgment. When collectively, we repeatedly, I want you to hear this last part. When collectively, we repeatedly, we confess our sins and pray to be written into God's book of life. God, we don't deserve it. But we really hope you'll put us in the book of life. And tomorrow we're going to go back to trying to earn it. Because we don't know what else to do. But what else to do is to understand Jesus already put your name there. That you get there, not because you can do anything, but because Jesus did everything. And he gives you that offer of eternal life. John 3.17 says, For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God wants to forgive you, friends. He wants to pour out his mercy into your life, not because you're good, but because he's good. This is why you can trust God. This is why you can say, I'm going to put all my trust in that basket. He doesn't demand for you, from you more than you can pay, and he gives more than you could ever earn. He just says, I will give to you everything that you need. That's what mercy is. It's the foundation of your relationship with God. God can do whatever it is that he wants to do, and you can trust him. Here's the good part, though. The good part is that, that mercy is exactly what God wants to give you. It is what he wants to give you. And so you can receive that today. God can do whatever he wants to do because he's God. And a relationship with God is based on his mercy. But thirdly, please understand, there is no grandfather clause. There just isn't. There is not a grandfather clause when it comes to salvation. In my ministry, um, I've actually been a part of putting up two church signs for churches that I pastored. The first one was down in Santee, which is in San Diego County. It was a long time ago now. But we had a, we had a sign. It was that, that typical Baptist church sign from the, from, you know, like from the 1950s and 60s, maybe even before, I don't know. But it was like two four-by-four four posts with, a, with an eight-by, you know, four-by-eight plywood between them that somebody painted, whitewashed, and then, and then put letters on it and, and wrote on it. And that's what we had. But the thing stood about 10 feet tall uh, along this main thoroughfare that we were on. And that was nice because people could see it. But it was really ugly and it really needed to be changed. And so, so we went, I said, you know, guys, we've got to get rid of this sign and put up something new. So we went down to the city to see what they allowed us to do. And we wanted to put up another 10-foot sign. We just wanted to make it modern and something that people would... Could, would, would read when they went by and we wouldn't be ashamed of it and, and, um, and they said okay you can put in a sign there because put it in exactly the same place it stood for like 25 years I'm not changing the location of it and, um, 
They said, we just, it's just going to blow over someday in the wind, so can we just put a new one up? And they said, sure, you can put up a new one. And so we said, okay, we're going to put up another 10-foot sign, just not made like that. And they said, no, you're not. I said, what do you mean? They said, it's, it's already there. We just want to replace it. They said, yeah, but the rules changed since then. They were arbitrary, and they were being vindictive. They wanted money, I think. But they said, you can only put up a sign that's four feet tall. I said, well, what happened to the other six feet? And they said, we don't like that anymore. And so we had to, we, they said, you can't, you're not grandfathered in just because you had one that was that tall. Can't do it. We can't even put up a sign that's as tall as the one, the church next door here in, in, in Prescott Valley because we're not grandfathered in. And so we have a sign that's about four feet tall. It's because everybody in the church on the city council came from California at some point. And, <laughs> and so they're acting like Californians. In Paul's day, there were a lot of people, I mean, most people, who believed that they had been grandfathered in to a right relationship with God simply because they were Jewish. We're Jewish, we're okay. So all these Jews that Paul preached to, all these people that he would go to talk to, they were God's chosen people, and, and he revealed himself to the world through them, and God had always and would always have a special relationship with the nation of Israel. And so when they looked at Paul, they said, hey, excuse us, we're, cho- we're God's chosen people. We don't need your message. We don't need your message of Jesus Christ. But the fact that they were his chosen people doesn't exempt them from the requirements of a relationship with God. And that's the part they didn't understand. And, and they have not been grandfathered into the kingdom just because they come from a Jewish heritage. And unless we, we think, well, what a bunch of dumb Jews. Why would they think that? Why would they think that they were grandfathered in? I meet people all the time who say, hey, well, I'm okay. I'm an American. I'm okay with God. Because we have this similar attitude, because of our prosperity and our position as world leaders, we think God is ready to give us this deal that no one else gets. And so they say, I guess I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a Christian, or I'm an American, rather. I'm a, I was born here, or I was, I've, I'm, now I am an American citizen, whatever it may be. And we think God favors us like he favors no others, and that he will bless us as he blesses no others. And so we have this same idea of of grandfathering in that the Jewish nation has. And here at First Southern, uh, we are Southern Baptist. And you may not understand what all that means and come to the New Member Seminar and you'll know. Uh, But but through most most of us here are, are probably really not Southerners. Unless you count Southern California as being Southern. But I know a few of you, John Clark, I know you, you, you're from Texas, but you consider that the South, I bet, don't you? Amen, yeah, that's what I thought. Some of you are from the South, and I know that. I know that because you tell me we have the best weather in the South, and we have the best food in the South, and we have the best football in the South, but you're here anyway. So it can't all be true. And there's this this sense that we must be the promised land in the south because, my goodness, there's a church on every corner. There was a young lady in our church before I came here, and she was she had gotten a, a scholarship to do her 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 doctorate degree in in. Um, as Alabama, I believe it was Arkansas or Alabama. I think it was Alabama, and um, and and she said, "Where am I going to go to church when I get there?" I said, "It doesn't matter." She said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Just go find find the intersection in in the center of the city. Stand right in the middle of it with a rock in your hand and just throw it. You'll hit a Southern Baptist church. <laughs> Any of the four corners, you'll 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 hit one of them there." She wrote back later. She said, "You weren't kidding, were you?" <laughs> I said, no, I wasn't kidding. You'll find them there. 
You know, this, this idea that, 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 that's, that, you know, if we're Southern Baptists, we, we've got a good deal with God. That we're, that we're somehow grandfathered in. And, and Southerners, you know, they, they go by the, the, by the philosophy of Hank Williams Jr. who said, if, if, if heaven ain't like Dixie, then I don't want to go. Um, you know, and so heaven's got to be like, like, like it is in the South. But the fact is, being Jewish, being American, being Southern is not enough. It just is not. Coming from a Christian family is not enough. I don't care if you're like me and you remember being in the crying room of a, of a Baptist church. You know, while, while the worship service was going on. It's not enough that you are raised in church. Uh, it is, there is no grandfather clause in the spiritual life because God doesn't have grandchildren. You know, where in the Bible does it say, you're my grandchild? You're not. You're not saved because your daddy was a preacher or a deacon. Or your granddaddy was. You're not saved because you came from a Southern Baptist church or any other kind of a church. Nobody is grandfathered in to the kingdom. Paul said in verse 8 here of Romans chapter 9, It is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. He's saying that we all have to be people with a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship to him. And that begins when you invite Jesus into your heart to be your Savior. And you ask him to take away your sin. And he does. And then that life is sustained in the very same way. The Christian life is a life of trust. It is a life of faith. It is not a religion. Christianity is not a religion. It is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that relationship with him... You're not grandfathered in. I don't care where your ancestry comes from or what you've done to try to earn it. You're just not grandfathered in. God desires to know you personally. He desires that you know him personally. And he wants to be in a relationship with you and not some distant, once removed type of relationship but a close, personal, intimate relationship. That's why Jesus Christ came into our world 2,000 years ago, so that you could have that relationship. That's also why you can trust him. God isn't arbitrary. He doesn't give one set of people one set of rules and another set of people another set of rules. It's been said that the ground Beneath the cross is level. We all stand on a level ground before the cross. No arbitrary vindictiveness. Just one set of rules. Know Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Trust him for everything. Why? Because all who call in the name of the Lord are going to be saved. As we close this morning, I know we really just barely skimmed the surface of, of this really profound chapter. But I don't preach for half a day, so we're going to call it quits at that point. But Paul says an awful lot in these 33 verses. Paul talks about the nature of God. He talks about God's preeminence. He talks about God's sovereignty. He tells us why we can trust him. And why do we trust him? We trust him because he is good. He can do anything he wants to do, and what he wants to do is bless your life with mercy and kindness. And if you have not come to know a God who does that, today that can change. Today you can come to know that God. Let's pray together. Father, Thank you for joining us today for Faith Point. Reach us online at firstsouthernpv.org or stop by to worship with us if you are in the Prescott Valley area. 
May God richly bless you today as you allow your faith to intersect with your life.